Welcome to this webinar, Strengthening Your Pelvic Floor. Thank you all for joining us today. I am Dr. Trish Murray, physician, best-selling author, and the Health Catalyst speaker. And the health, and I am so excited to have Jim Chaput, who is an applied movement neurology master, joining me for this webinar on how to improve the function of the pelvic floor. I am going to initiate this presentation the same way I usually present on the webinars with the slides, like you see this first welcoming slide. And I'm gonna use slides in the beginning while I'm speaking to introduce um, the anatomy of the pelvic floor and what things can cause the pelvic floor to develop dysfunction. Then, I'm going to turn the webinar over to Jim, who is going to discuss his introductory or initial concepts with a slide. But then we're going to stop sharing the slides and Jim is going to present his information and exercises that he's gonna demonstrate uh, to you and that you can do along with him if you choose. Uh, in order to strengthen your pelvic floor in the same way that we present during our Discover Health Movement Membership classes so that you get a sense of how the information is presented and how to participate in the classes. So let's get started. So before we dive too deep, let's review some basic anatomy. The pelvic floor is made up of supportive muscles, tendons, and ligaments at the base of your pelvis. So folks, your pelvis is a bowl. And these, all of these items I've just listed, the muscles, the tendons, the ligaments at the base of the bowl of your pelvis are also completely in, involved or uh, surrounded and engulfed in fascia, the connective tissue, the fabric of life. So these muscles and this entire connective tissue uh, co collection of tissues stretch like a trampoline from the tailbone. If you're familiar with the word the, or the name, the coccyx, that's the tail of your tailbone, the very pointy end. And so it, these uh, tissues attach at the, at the coccyx and the, and the pelvic bone at the, again, at the base of your pelvic bowl, and they travel forward and also attach to your pubic bone. Your pubic bone is in the front of your pelvis, kind of at, just above your genitals. And you may be able to feel that if you feel your belly and you go down from your lower belly down into your pelvis, you're going to engage with a bone that you'll hit, and that is the pubic bone. The pelvic floor supports the functionality of the bladder, the uterus, the vagina and ge the gen male genitalia, and the rectum, providing support and stability to the organs of the abdominal cavity and, of course, the pelvis. Additionally, pelvic floor muscles are also important for sexual function folks for both men and women. So open your ears and make sure you get your pelvic floor functioning as optimally as possible. So now there are a number of factors that can lead to weak or loosened pelvic floor muscles. This, mo this is most commonly a result of childbirth in women, but for men, common causes of weak pelvic floor muscles include surgery for prostate cancer, bladder or bowel problems such as constipation or bladder problems for either men or women, heavy lifting, chronic coughing, and more. So the following are the most common contributors. Again, pregnancy and childbirth for women, straining on the toilet, chronic coughing, heavy lifting, high impact intense exercise, age, 
and obesity. In most cases, it is possible to improve the function of your pelvic floor and tighten the pelvic floor muscles and connective tissue and regain control of your pelvic floor. So let's take a closer look. Now during pregnancy and childbirth, the pelvic floor muscles get completely stretched out from the weight of the baby. Also the hormones that change and are designed to loosen your tissues of the pelvic floor. And of course, all the efforts of pushing that baby out during labor, these connective tissues don't stand a chance at the base of your pelvic floor. Now, severely weakened pelvic floor muscles, usually following several pe pregnancies, can cause pelvic organs to slip down further into the pelvic bowl than they belong, and this is called pelvic organ prolapse. Prolapse gives you a dragging feeling in your pelvis and in women in the, vag in the vagina because the womb the bowel and the bladder push against the walls of the vagina and against the walls of the pelvic bowl. And this condition is more likely later in life as you age rather than right after birth. It's usually as the tissues are aging and becoming looser and looser that these problems develop. Doing, during, doing your pelvic floor exercises after childbirth will prevent and, and treat stress incontinence, improve the circulation of blood to your perineum or the genital, genital area, which will help reduce any swelling and any bruising from childbirth. It will also rebuild strength in your pelvic floor. Now remember, everyone is different, folks. So you'll want to check with your healthcare professional that you've been working with to decide how soon after labor it is safe to begin pelvic strengthening exercises. Now repeated straining of the pelvic floor muscles can occur from using the bathroom, as we said, chronic coughing, heavy lifting, and high impact exercises. The straining can create pressure on the pelvic floor, ultimately leading to prolapse. Whether li lifting weights at the gym or for a specific job task that requires heavy, intense lifting repeatedly, it is important to perform heavy lifting with proper form to protect yourself and, of course, your pelvic floor. Now, an additional note, if chronic constipation is an issue, you should have the cause addressed by a healthcare professional to prevent pelvic floor damage later on. If you have chronic constipation year after year after year, it could be the root cause of your pelvic floor dysfunction. And if you truly want to get to the root cause of your constipation, rather than simply be prescribed a pill, then I strongly suggest you seek out a functional medicine provider to work with to figure things out. Now additional causes of a weakened pelvic floor are attributed to aging and also obesity. Weakened muscles in general is common with age, folks. As we age and, and, and if we don't take care of our bodies, everything starts to fall. Uh, the pelvic floor is no you know, uh, you know, doesn't get out of that. It all starts to get loose and dry up and degenerate and weaken. I was listening to a talk the other day and the gentleman was talking about the aging process and he said, you know, eventually we need to retire because our body becomes a full-time job. And that is so, so true. The pel and the pelvic floor is part of that full-time job. So the pelvic floor exercises can be done at any age to improve conditions associated with pelvic, with a weak pelvic floor. And my chapter in my new book, the chapter is titled The Missing Link to Healthy Aging, and it's in my new best-selling book, No More Band-Aids 2.0, Finding Answers in a Broken Medical System, explains my chapter, it's a collaborative book 
but my chapter explains the fascial system and how our connective tissues are gelatinous in nature and they dry up as we age. And if we do not move and care for them properly, then they're gonna become dysfunctional and weak. So the pelvic floor is very important part of your connective tissue, fascial and muscular system. It also is affected by the hormonal changes that occur as we age. So lack of or reduce or reduction in estrogen, reduction in testosterone, progesterone is going to be also involved in pelvic floor dysfunction. Now being overweight for a prolonged time year after year can also place more considerable strain on the pelvic floor, increasing the risk of leaking urine in particular. Now pelvic floor exercises, as well as weight loss of course, can be beneficial. So before we get into the ex actual exercises, let's review the benefits of strengthening the pelvic floor. Benefits include, and the, we'll put at the top of the list, increased sexual sensation and orgasmic potential. Two, increased social confidence and quality of life with improved bladder and bowel control. Improved recovery from childbirth and gynecological surgery. Improved recovery after prostate surgery, re or gynecological surgery for that matter. Reduced risk of prolapse. Now in order to start pelvic floor muscle training, you must be able to identify your pelvic floor muscles correctly and feel them and be able to, if you will, isolate them so that you know what you're working on. Now, have you heard of Kegel exercises? It's a common term out there that people may have heard of and you may be familiar with it and be able to do it well. And then there are others maybe listening that aren't that familiar with it. So we're going to use this concept and I'm gonna teach it to you. But the purpose of it tonight is to be able to identify the pelvic floor. So this move in, involves consciously drawing up and contracting, if you will, your pelvic floor. And it will help you get familiar with the feeling of working your pelvic floor. So here's how you perform a Kegel. Now, you, can, you wanna start by getting comfortable, folks. So if you are in a position where, you, or in an area where you can you know, comfortably lay down, then go ahead and do it. If, and you wanna lay down with your back uh, either on the floor or on the bed or on a couch, and you can bend your knees and put your feet flat on, on either the floor or the surface you're laying on. Or you can also sit up comfortably in a chair, but I would want you to put both feet comfortably on the floor. So you wanna sit in a comfortable position or lay down in a comfortable position with your knees bent and your feet flat on the floor. The sec now what you wanna do is squeeze, try and consciously squeeze and lift the rectal and genital areas as if you were trying to stop yourself from urinating. So try and do that. Try and with your mind's eye and your, and your thought process, focus on your rectum and your genital area. And as if you were urinating, feel what it would be like to lift up and squeeze that area as if you were stopping either a bowel movement or urination. And hold it for about five or 10 seconds. You should feel a closing feeling when you squeeze, as if think your rectum is coming up and your genital pelvic bowl is getting smaller and the tissues are coming up into the pelvic bowl and it's squeezing. Now you can repeat squeezing and holding for you know five to ten seconds and then release and then you can of course repeat it multiple times until you get the sense of how to engage your pelvic floor and this should help you start to be able to consciously identify your pelvic floor tissues so you have an idea of the area you want to focus on 
So with that now, I am going to turn the presentation over to Jim Chaput, who is an applied movement neurology master, who is, an, who is excellent at looking at both the nervous system and the fascial system, your connective tissue, to understand how they both interact to keep us functioning optimally. So let me stop my sharing and spotlight Jim. So Jim. Thank you, Dr. Trish. Okay, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about going beyond Kegels and some of the other things you have to consider to really get the best results. And then things that I would assess to try to help someone get back to optimal function. And then, as you said, we'll, we'll, I'll tell you some potentially, if you want to follow along, some equipment that you might want to get handy. And I'll show you a series of exercises that will go through the different areas that we assess. And then you figure out which ones do you need and you do a daily routine to improve the function of your pelvic floor. Okay, so the first thing that I wanna cover is that you know, the Kegel exercise is one piece of pelvic floor control. So that's your volitional control. So if you've done Kegels and they've worked really well for you, you probably should continue with that. But if you've done the Kegels and found they help a little bit, but not as much as you would expect, I'll give you some of the reasons why. So much of your pelvic floor control is actually reflexive and not volitional. So it's part of the emotional motor system, which was discovered by Gert Holstage. And other areas in the emotional motor system include smiles and breathing. So those areas controlled at least partially by the emotional motor system get triggered reflexively. So if you imagine, if I give you my really good fake smile. Most of you would recognize that as not a very good smile, right? So I'm using volitional muscles to create a smile. And uh, one of my nephews is the best at this because every time I see his picture on Facebook, I think, oh my gosh, what is, what is going on here? But if instead you get a genuine smile, you can tell the difference. So if I wanna fake a genuine smile, I just need to think a happy thought. So I think of my crazy dog, Roly, and, and it's just like a smile comes, right? And the reason why it's different is because the emotion that I'm feeling triggers those muscles to activate the smile. And the pelvic floor is not exactly triggered by emotions, but much of it is reflexive, similar to smile and breathing. So there are other reasons why the Kegels themselves might not be enough and core exercises alone might not be enough. So there's direct fascial connections between the pelvic floor down through the feet. And then also some of the spinal nerves coming out of the sacrum that control our body, also they, they innervate the pelvic floor and the feet. So what does that really mean? It means how you move can have a significant impact on your pelvic floor health. So uh, late last year and into early this year, I did a, I did a small study. I, I think I had maybe a half dozen people that, that, that came in, people with pelvic floor dysfunction. And what I did is they got three treatments from you know, through my applied movement neurology, and then I gave them exercises to do. So I didn't really have enough people to draw, you know, great conclusions, but one thing I, I found, every single person that came in had inhibition in their emotional motor system around their pelvic floor. There were, you know, different ranges of inhibitions. So I did resets for some of the, for all of these people, and then I gave them exercises. and. What I found was most of the people in the study, their symptoms resolved even before the third treatment. So the combination of 
removing some excess noise in the nervous system and giving them some exercises alleviated their symptoms. And, uh, you know, you could do kegels all day, but if you've got inhibition in the reflexes, you need something else. Uh, and then since the study, I continue looking for other solutions because I didn't have 100% success in the study. So therefore, okay, the answers are somewhere else. And I've learned some additional things. And I'm going to go over with you my current approach of what I think needs to be assessed to get you to optimal pelvic floor health. So the first thing is posture and gait core strength and leg strength, the reflexive control that I mentioned, and then also breathing. So to get to optimal function, all of those areas should be really good. Um, okay, what I'm gonna do is, I'm just gonna show you a couple of things I'm going to use to show you some exercises. So if you need to get them, you can. So. I am going to use a half dome. If you don't have one, you could use a rolled towel instead. That's going to be for some stretching. I'm going to use a yoga block and we're going to basically hold that between our knees. If you don't have a yoga block handy, actually even a coaster would work. And then I'm also going to use some small weights for a couple of the movements. It's not, if you don't have the weights, follow along. And then this recording is going to be available later. So if you don't want to follow along with the movements today, just, you know, pay attention to what's happening and then come back to the recording and do a follow along with that. So it's probably going to try to do, you know, 10 to 15 minutes of movement and show you what builds what could be a routine for you that you could do every day. Okay, I'm gonna get a quick drink. So the first thing is posture. I'm gonna adjust my camera a little bit. So the reason why posture is important is that those pelvic floor muscles that are supporting your organs are going to work best when your skeleton is stacked. So a couple of postural problems that could lead to pelvic floor issues if your butt is really tucked under. So what's happening is your pelvis is tilted so that now instead of gravity pushing down directly on those pelvic floor muscles, they're at a disadvantage. The muscles are dealing this way, but gravity is going that way. The other one could be excessive anterior pelvic tilt, and you might see like an excessive arch in your back. In the same thing that the muscles, the pelvis is actually tilted and is not aligned to make the most use of those muscles. So one of the things you can do is if you find the top and bottom bones of your pelvis, it should be straight up and down. So if I tuck under, the top is too far back. And if I stick my butt out, the top is too far forward. So what you really want with your posture, and sometimes it's just habit and you can actually just fix it by just focusing on, can I just have my pelvis in neutral? So it's vertical. Can I have my hips over my ankles. So bad would be leaning way to the front. I want to keep stacked. And then ideally my shoulders would be over my hips and my head would be over my shoulders. So many of us might have this problem of the tech neck with the head sticking out. You just need to pull it back and make a habit of noticing when your posture is not great and just catch yourself and say, okay, I need to just straighten myself up. A couple other areas to think about is your feet generally should be about pelvis width so that your legs are fairly vertical. And then 
a tricky one for many of us is our feet, the outsides of our feet should be pointed forward, which feels really strange for most of us because some of us are standing duck footed on a regular basis and maybe even walking duck footed, but that mechanically that does not allow our muscle muscles to function optimally. So what I would say is try turning your feet in a bit, getting them all the way to the outsides being straightforward is a bit of a challenge and you may not even have the hip mobility to do it if you've been walking duck footed for a long time. But if you point them in a bit more than you think and just kind of feel that and then get everything else aligned, that would be pretty good posture. And that's the posture you want to work towards having all the time. Another thing with your posture is when you're seated, Sometimes what happens is we sit on our tailbone and you get this turtle hunchy kind of thing, or you might exaggerate it and go way to the front and then get this big arch. So instead, find the middle, work back and forth, and then find the middle so you feel those bones and then your posture is now more optimally aligned for pelvic floor health. Okay. There are a couple of reasons why you might struggle to have good posture or good walking. As I mentioned, because of fascial connections and nerve connections with the pelvis floor to the feet, Walking is actually a really good exercise to stimulate pelvic floor control if you're walking correctly. So if you have super tight calves, what might happen is when you're walking, you might have to compensate by doing a lot of bending or you might turn your feet out to avoid that calf stretch. So one exercise you can do is Get this half dome or a rolled up towel and just put the ball of your foot on it. And then what you're going to try to do is just step forward a little bit until you feel that stretch. So my leg is straight. I'm feeling a bit of a stretch in that calf and then I can just hold this. If you or taking a step forward and your knee bends or your, your hip twists, back it off a little bit and just hold this. And if you're feeling pretty comfortable and you think I can go just a little bit further, that's okay too. It should feel a little bit of discomfort maybe just from that stretch in that calf, but it should feel okay. If you're feeling pain, back off. It should be, you know, feel the stretch some mild discomfort is maybe okay. And what you're gonna go for is at least 30 seconds and you wanna work up to maybe 60 seconds or more. So if you're doing this once a day, you'd go about 60 seconds say, or a little bit longer, and you could even do it more. If you have really tight calves, like I know some of the people on this uh, webinar do, because I saw some people on the list that have plantar fasciitis, which means your calves are probably epically tight. You want to make sure you can safely do this without pain and then slowly get that calf flexibility. Okay, we're going to switch to the other one if you're following along. So again, just get the ball of the foot on there, get my legs straight, take a step forward. And interestingly, the left one for me feels tighter than the other one. So what I would do then is I should actually spend more time on the one that feels a bit tighter because you really want things pretty close to balanced. So we're just gonna hang out here for a little bit and I'll show you a little um, modification I would do and I'm gonna do it on this tighter side is I might just pulse my hip forward back and forth about five times and then keep that stretch on at the front and then do a little 
side to side. And then I'm going to do a little twisting. And then I'm just going to try to get a little deeper into the stretch. So sometimes when you pulse back and forth, you do the side to side, do some rotations, it may loosen up a little bit for you. And then just come off. So again, you can start with even 30 seconds or so and just get in the habit of doing it and then work yourself up to being able to do each side for about 60 seconds, feeling a good stretch, but keeping the legs straight, the hips pointed forward. There's another one we can do that, again, tightness in the calves and the hamstrings can affect posture and it can affect walking. So this next one, it's either going to potentially stretch your calves or it might also stretch your hamstrings. I'm just going to get a chair. So to start, you can use a chair like this. I'm just going to point my feet so the outsides are pointing more forward than usual. And then what I just want to do is start by putting my hands here. Now the first test is, can I actually relax my spine and get some curve in my spine? And then if so, where do I feel it? And I feel it a little bit in the calves and more in the hamstring. If I push my hip back a little bit, definitely hamstring. So if your back is really rounded, your goal is to take deep breaths and and see if you can get that back to relax. If you're feeling a very strong stretch and your back is rounded, you could go to a slightly higher chair to start, maybe put something on top of it. But again, you're gonna work towards just pushing those hips back a little bit, relaxing that spine. And again, we're gonna try to at least 30 seconds, but really you're gonna to build towards that 60 second mark. And arms are straight. I'm just trying to relax my spine, push the hips back maybe a little bit, relax and see if I can get those calves and hamstrings to relax a bit. You can make it a little more challenging or a lot more challenging. If I take the same position, but now I'm on my half dome or my rolled towel. And then this for me is gonna make it much more of a calf stretch. I'm still gonna to try to push my hips back a little bit. There the hamstrings come on. And then again, just relax my spine a little bit. If the other version was really challenging for you, you could stick with that. You don't need to necessarily go to the half dome, but if you wanna to work towards really getting those calves and hamstrings flexible enough that even with the half dome, you can relax that spine a bit and get a nice natural curve. And then I'm just gonna bend my knees slightly and come off. Okay, so those are a couple of things that could potentially help you improve your posture because what you might find is tightness in the calves and the hamstrings might be causing you to alter your posture to avoid that tightness and it might affect your gait as well. When you're walking, you might either shorten your stride to avoid the tight calves, you might turn your feet out and things like that. Okay, the next one is, it's a pelvic list exercise, which is about being able to use the strength in your legs to lift one foot off the ground so that you can walk without compensations. So the first thing, you're just going to get back into your good posture. And again, try to point those feet 
the outsides going forward or at least closer to that. And then to do this exercise, I'm gonna shift my weight over to the left foot and then I'm gonna feel like I'm pushing this left hip down to lift the right foot off. So shift the weight to the foot, push the hip down so I'm lifting the other foot off the ground. This isn't intended to be a balance exercise, so you are more than welcome to hold on to something for balance if needed. If this feels easy enough to do, if your balance is good enough, it's fine to do it without holding on to something. And we're just, we're, again, we're gonna try to hold this initially for at least 30 seconds, and you can build up to more. And what you'll notice, what I'm noticing is, as the time adds up, and I start to feel a little fatigue, I can feel little adjustments happening. Okay, and then we can just relax. And then again, I'm just gonna check my posture. I'm gonna move my weight to the other side, push that hip down. And what this really is, if you can do this, it means when you're walking, you're able to get the hip to lift the other foot to take the step. If your hips are, if you're unable to get that foot off the floor without either bending your knee or bending your hip, what's happening is you're having to lift the leg off the ground with your knee and your hip, which is not really mechanically uh, intended. Biomechanically, we should be able to use the big muscles over here to get the pelvis to list so that the other foot can take a step. And then I'm gonna relax. Okay, I'm gonna show another version of this that's more challenging. If you've had a hip replacement, just stick with this floor version. If you have any reason to believe that uh, your hips will not be able to take uh, additional work beyond what we just did, you can stick with that version. I'm just gonna get one more prop or a couple of props. You have two options here. You can either use a yoga block. The challenge with the yoga block, especially for someone as heavy as me, is it becomes a balance exercise because if I stand on it, it's a bit squishy. So I potentially either need something to balance, to hold on to. Instead, I'm just using a pack of paper. So what I'm gonna do is, I'm gonna start with the left side again. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna stand up on the paper, the other leg is just hanging off. So the first test is, can I actually, am I strong and stable enough to just hold this position? And then the question is, can I push this standing hip down a bit to get the other foot even higher? So that's one option to hold this. Now we can make this more challenging by allowing, keeping the leg straight, allowing the hip to drop so just kiss the floor and come back up. So kiss and come back up. And you'd work to, you'd probably wanna do 10 or 12 of these, or you could time it, do 30 seconds or so. It's, if you haven't done it before, initially it might be challenging to build up that many reps. You can also just, again, stand in this position and then occasionally just say, okay, can I push this down and lift the other one up? Just do a couple more. And again, you can definitely hold something for balance. This is not intended as strictly a balance exercise. It's a hip strength exercise. And then I'm just gonna bend the knee slightly and come off. We'll do the other side. And one of the things is when you're doing this, so I'm gonna do the second side now. If one side feels weaker, you wanna probably do extra work on that side. So if once you've done this exercise, so again, I'm gonna push and see if I can lift that foot. And then I'm gonna go down to the floor, keep my legs straight, and I'm just kissing the floor, do a few of those. So one of the things I notice is my balance standing on the right leg is not as good as when it's standing on the left leg. So I have a couple of options. I could get something to hold on to, or I might just do 
extra work on this one so that it gets stronger over time and I balance out. I do have a history of right hip issues and my right hip is tighter than the other one. So is it, is my balance the cause of that or is that the cause of my balance? So it's something I need to work on. Let's do a couple more. And then bend the knee slightly and come off. Okay, so a couple options there. You can do them from the floor. If you're ready, you can do them off an object or you can do it off a step, something that allows you to increase the range of motion and makes the exercise more challenging. So the prescription for this exercise would be working around maybe 10 to 12 reps or accumulating time of 30 seconds or so. And if it starts to feel really easy, you just increase the challenge a bit. Okay. Just a quick drink. For the next one, I'm gonna use a yoga block and I'm also gonna show you how you could just do it with a coaster. So we're focused on the strength of the inner thighs while maintaining a neutral pelvis. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hold the block between my knees but I'm gonna to try to keep my feet out at that pelvis width. I'm gonna lay down. I want a little bit of arch in my back, so I should be able to get my hand under there. And now my goal is keep squeezing the block and lift my feet off the floor while keeping my feet apart. If you drop the block, you weren't able to squeeze with your knees while exercising those lower abdominals. So your goal is gonna to be to build up so that you can. So a couple options here is you can just practice squeezing and holding. If you can get your feet just a little bit off, that's okay as well. And then work up to being able to do 10 or 12 of those. Okay. If you, so if you, if you found a version that works for you, go ahead and do 10 reps of that. Keep your feet apart, keep the object squeezed, and I'm just gonna show another version. So if I don't have a yoga block handy, I just take a coaster. And same thing, hands can go under my spine, and I'm just gonna do the reps like this. So again, what you're doing here is keeping the pelvis in neutral with that little arch in your spine allows you to keep using these inner thigh muscles. If your back gets really flat, if your tailbone tucks under, you might be using the wrong muscles. So make sure you keep the arch, you squeeze the knees, keep the feet apart, and really feel like those inner thigh muscles are doing the job. And if, as you lift your feet off the floor, your feet come in, really fight to keep them out and just limit how much you lift your feet to what you can hold the feet in until you build up some strength there and you can do the full movement. Okay. For the next one, I'm gonna use a couple of small weights to do, to do this. Uh, I think there are two and a half pound weights or so. So if you have some weights handy, you can use those. If not, just use your hands and you can always add the weights later when you try it as part of your routine. Okay, so as I mentioned, the pelvic floor and the feet are quite connected and gait has a lot to do with pelvic floor control. So when we walk, that causes the pelvic floor muscles to reflexively work. And this is apparently one of the reasons why 
children start to develop that control as they learn to walk. So what we're gonna do here is I'm gonna take a split stance. So my right foot's gonna be more in front than the left. I'm just gonna widen it out a little bit. And then I'm gonna point my feet out more like duck footed. Okay, so the first thing I wanna test is, can I just move up and down in this position? So if, if not, I need to adjust my feet until I have the right flexibility that I can do it. If I can bounce, I'm just gonna move back a little bit. I'm gonna start here. So we start with the bouncing and then as I come up, I'm gonna punch upwards. So I'm gonna bounce up, bounce up, So that's one. Then I also want to, I want to hit some different planes. So I'm now going to punch to the side. So if I go down, out, down, out, down, out, out. And of course we move in three dimensions. So I'm going to punch forward and just rotate a little bit. So down, punch, down, punch, punch, down, punch. And then if I have those, I can get the core a little more involved by reaching more backwards. So if I go here, it's a bit harder, but you get the core involved by just pushing that way. And you can also do the other versions as well. So if I punch to the side and back, I'll get the core more involved as well. And then same thing with the rotation, I might just Okay, so those will get these uh, inner thigh muscles working eccentrically. So just that bouncing will stimulate that and adding the punching and getting the core involved, again, is gonna help stimulate the pelvic floor reflexive control. We can also turn the feet in a little bit and then we'll switch to the other side. So again, the first thing I wanna do is just see if I can bounce. My ankles are a little bit tight when I turn my feet in, so my stance is maybe a little bit narrower. So just test it first. Can you bounce? And then let's go up, 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 out, 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 punch punch and then let's try some getting that core more involved so back 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 and then out and back and then rotate and some of these might feel a bit awkward and that's okay i mean some of them feel a little strange to me as well but what it's doing is you're hitting these muscles in a lot of different ways and you're getting the muscles turned on and that can translate to better pelvic floor control. And um, you can do these, again, you can do them every day. I would do a set with the feet out and then do a set with the feet in and then let's switch to the other side. So we're gonna go left foot forward, right foot back Again, I'm turning my feet out a bit. I'm first just testing my position. Is that okay? Yeah, so then I'm just gonna go down and punch, down and punch. Then go out, 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 out. Then rotation, 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 rotation. And then let's get some of that backwards. So back, back, and then out and then rotation. And then one last set we'll do before we move on to the next thing. Again, we'll just turn the feet in a bit. Just check, make sure I can do that. And then down and punch, down and punch. Then out. And then 
rotation. Okay, and then we'll go back. Oh, and back. And then big rotation back. Okay, and that would be the complete set for that exercise. Feet out, one set, feet in, one set, switch sides, feet out, feet in. And again, you can do that one every day. And I did, you know, 12 or so of each one. Uh, maybe if you mix it up and do the different directions, focusing on back, you do some extra ones, but you know, find one that feels comfortable for you that you can be successful at and you can do that one every day. Okay. Got one last exercise and then we'll just do a quick uh, breathing exercise. One last movement exercise. So this one again, we'll take advantage of the connection between our gait and pelvic floor. And actually, I'm not gonna use the weights for this one. I'm just gonna show you without the weights. So because of the connection between our gait and pelvic floor, we can use a simple lunge, which is in a way an exaggerated step. And then we take that step and we add some rotation to it towards the front leg. So I'm gonna go right foot first. I'm gonna step forward, rotate. And that back heel is coming off the ground to simulate walking. I'm gonna take a step to the side, rotate to that side. And then I'm gonna take a rotational step and rotate to that side. Left foot, forward, rotate towards that left foot, sideways, rotate, and then rotation, and rotate. And what this is doing is it is stimulating that reflexive control, that emotional motor system. So that gait connection is great for us because you can improve your pelvic floor function with a simple exercise like that and just tell your nervous system, hey, I'm serious about this control, give it back to me. What I like to do is I love to hit different angles. So we're gonna do the same thing. We're gonna go back to the right foot, but this time we're gonna swing our arms up and away. So right foot, step up and away, right foot to the side, up and away, and then right foot rotation, up and away, left foot, forward, up and away, sideways, up and away, and then rotation, up and away. And you probably feel it in a slightly different spot, and that's great because we're trying to hit the core and the legs in slightly different ways to really get things fired up. So the last one I'll show you before we move on to the breathing is gonna go back to the right foot, and we're gonna swing the arms down. So step forward, down, sideways, down, rotation, down. And again, it's just gonna hit the core just a little bit differently. So now left foot, step forward, down, step sideways, mm -hmm. down, and rotation, down. And that's your full set. So you would do all three lunges, forward, sideways, and rotation. You do neutral arm swing, up arm swing, down arm swing. Do all of those on each side and that will really get things fired up and you'll, you may get other benefits as well. Just one last idea for you. If you decide that taking the steps just is maybe a little bit too much, especially with that much, that many reps, you can just start in the position and just here, here, here. And then you can just change the position to that sideways, neutral, up, down. And then you can also just give yourself a slightly rotated stance. And again, here, here, here. 
So there's always a way to modify it. And for those of you who come to this Discover Movement classes, I teach the Movement for Longevity class, you know I'm always giving you different options, but just keep that in mind. If, if you need additional modifications, pop a message in the chat and I'll be happy to uh, address those either tonight or I can always do a follow up with you. Okay, so last thing before I hand it back to Dr. Trish. Let's see if I can get my camera in the right spots. Okay, breathing. I just quickly want to show you how to make sure you're doing diaphragmatic breathing. So sometimes what happens is we chest breathe, but that's not really gonna help with our pelvic floor function. So what we wanna do is focus on that belly breathing. So a simple exercise, you can try it even just sitting down, is put your hand a little bit of pressure there and just take a deep breath and push your hand. And, and you can also try just standing, try to get that good posture and then, and what you find is if you struggle to get that belly breathing, that is one of the things that might be contributing to some of the pelvic floor issues. So as we're doing that belly breathing, the diaphragm is pushing down in the pelvic floor, but over time, the more you're belly breathing, your system gets trained to deal with that pressure. So if you're doing a lot of chest breathing and not belly breathing, that's one of the reasons why your pelvic floor might weaken over time. So with the, one of the things you can do is either part of your warm up or at the end of your routine, just do some practice of that belly breathing and just make sure you're, you're getting some good diaphragmatic breathing every day. So just to wrap up, if some or all of these exercises are really, they seem like good ones for you, you could do a daily routine. The whole thing could take you 10 minutes or less. Do it every day. The more often you do it, the faster it will stick. So if your calves are super tight, you could do the calf stretches three times a day. You'll get faster results than if you just do it once a day. The other exercises, if you do the whole routine and it takes you about 10 minutes and you do it every day, what I would expect is that as soon as two to three weeks, you could notice a significant difference. If you're doing it less frequently, it might take longer. And then one thing to consider is if you do the, the exercises just about every day, things are going really well, but you're still struggling with the pelvic floor control and health, you might need something else. So as Dr. Trish mentioned, you might need to speak to a healthcare provider. Um, I'm not a healthcare provider so much as a movement therapist, but you know, the treatments I offer potentially could be the answer as well. So, you know, I would say if you want to see what you can do on your own and see how much you can do to improve your pelvic floor health, I would say try the exercises for at least two to three weeks, do them every day, and hopefully you'll get some significant improvement. If not, at that point, I'd suggest consult with your preferred provider or send me a message for a free consultation and I'll be happy to help you out. All right, Dr. Trish, I can turn it back to you. I think you're still mute. Jim, that was awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. Because so folks, you're realizing with seeing that and engaging with that, whether you, you tr went along and did the exercises with Jim or not, remember you can get the recording off YouTube and so forth to do it later if you weren't doing the exercises. But if you were, um, and as you were watching, the idea folks is you understanding that when, you know, the traditional medical model so many times looks at their focus is going to be only on the muscles and the connective tissue of the bottom of the bowl that I described in the beginning of the anatomy of your pelvic bowl. But folks, your fascial system, your nervous system, your connective tissue system is three-dimensional and connected from your head 
to your toes. So you've got to move everything and engage it all in order to optimize the function of, let's say, an isolated area like the pelvic bowl. So <laughs> Jim, that was awesome. I'm gonna sh try and share back uh, a couple last slides. So let's see if I can uh, do that. So now I know Jim discussed some great information today. So let's do a quick review. Strengthening the pelvic floor and improving its function involves more than just your pelvic muscles. One, first make sure you have good posture. Two, stretch your calves and hamstrings as needed. Three, strengthen your hips and your core. Four, stimulate reflexive control with bounces and lunges. And five, practice diaphragmatic breathing. So who's ready to commit to strengthening your pe pelvic floor muscles and function for better health? Now, again, remember that we always list tomorrow on our Discover Health Facebook uh, group, within our Discover Health Facebook group, our closed group, the list of resources from these webinars. So if you are interested in being able to follow some links to some more information to do your own reading and your own studying on, on some of the resources we use, and you are already a member of our Discover Health Facebook group, then you just go there tomorrow or you'll get a link about it or a post that it's been posted there. If you are not already a member, of our Discover Health Facebook group, then all you need to do is go to Facebook and go to our Discover Health Functional Medicine Center Facebook page and then request to join the group and you'll get access to that information. Remember, we also transcribe the script from every webinar I do and we put it on my website, discoverhealthfmc.com as a blog. We also edit and play the audio on my podcast entitled Discover Health Podcast. And this episode, as I said in the beginning, will also be posted on YouTube so that you can see Jim's demonstrations and follow along and do the exercises with him as many times as you wish so that you can become proficient at them. We are always trying fi to find ways to help you optimize your health. Now, that's a wrap, folks. And I hope everyone learned valuable information regarding the importance of a strong pelvic floor, how to locate your pelvic muscles and connective tissue and the benefits of participating in strengthening exercises and three-dimensional movement regularly. You also should feel well-equipped to get started today. And if anyone has any questions, please don't hesitate to reach out at any time. You can reach us at our email. The best email to reach is a coach, our health coach Trisha's email at discoverhealthcoaching at gmail.com. So thank you all so much for joining us today. I know with a little work, each of you is going to be on your way to accomplishing your goals to improve pelvic floor strength and function. But also, I know it's tough to remember all that was presented and be able to apply it properly. This is why we have created Discover Health Movement membership, which is a completely online program that gives you three different movement, movement classes per week. Movement for longevity, which is taught by Jim Chaput in the same way you interacted with him during this program. Another class is self myofascial release, which is taught by Lisa Burke. And the third class is a yoga flow class, which is taught by Megan Vestal. 
I have also done podcasts with each of the instructors recently. And you can go to my Discover Health podcast to listen to, I know uh, Megan's first podcast, I believe has been played. And I believe the next one will be played that uh, was one between myself and Jim, who you heard during this presentation. With our Discover Health Movement membership, you get three classes per week that are live and new every week, and you get 12 new classes per month. You can opt to do those, the, the membership as a live member, which means that allows you to take the classes in real time with the instructors presenting in real time like Jim did tonight, so that you can interact with them and even ask questions through the chat or of course, like tonight, we're at the end, I'm gonna see if anyone has any specific questions for Jim or me. Or if the times of the classes don't work for your schedule, then you can opt to do the membership as only a recorded level of the membership, which means you get access to all the recordings and you can do them at any time of day you choose. Either way, this collaborative and supportive types of movement will provide you with, with what you need to optimize not only your pelvic floor, but your overall health. We've had people taking these classes over the last five months that have told us their cognition is improving, along with their move, ability to move, decreasing their pain, and things like constipation and urinary uh, incontinence, for example, have improved because of the fact that you are moving your body three-dimensionally and improving the function of your entire body. So either way, this is going to optimize your health, decrease your pain, gain confidence in self-treatment of injuries is another thing we've heard as benefits from people. And of course, be able to keep up with your kids and your grandkids. To, to learn more about this program and sign up, go to discoverhealthfmc.com forward slash hashtag movement, just like the last few slides have shown at the top of the slide. Again, that's discoverhealthfmc.com forward slash hashtag movement. So as I say, that's a wrap for tonight. So I'm going to stop sharing the slides all together. And Jim, if you want to come back on with your video and, um, and unmute. And so if anyone has any particular questions of what you were demonstrated tonight or questions about the pelvic floor in any way, feel free to either type them in the chat if you wish or unmute yourself and just ask us the questions. This is what the way we interact with our Discover Health uh, Movement membership. You can ask questions at the end of Jim or even during, you can also unmute and ask him a question or, or the other instructors. I'm just gonna type the link in the chat so it'll be easier. That'd be great. I didn't realize that there was so much connected to um, keeping it in, in per, you know, performing correctly, et cetera. I, have, I know someone who had to have surgery twice um, because of a prolapse. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm really happy with the movement, et cetera. <laughs> it, it, it's more beneficial than not now, yeah. Yeah, and I think getting in the habit of doing it on a regular basis, that it really adds up. I mean, you know, I, I know you're a regular in, in class and mm. you've been getting great results and, and other people as well have just talked about, like people come to class and they don't feel great at the start of the class, but by the end of the class, they're really feeling so much better. So, and, you know, in my class and I think the other classes, um, probably the yoga flow as well, the movement's complex enough that you, you kind of have to pay attention. And that's one of the reasons why you get those cognitive benefits is that yeah. you're really upping the, uh, your brains, you're exercising your brain at the same time you're exercising your body. Yeah. I, I had done a 1000 piece puzzle during the 
co beginning of the COVID and I reali realized when I was doing all the, the movements, et cetera, classes, when I tried it after, it would come so quickly on the pieces. <laughs> so, yeah. Mm. That's an unexpected ben benefit of being able to do puzzles faster, but it sounds great. <laughs> You know, we have someone who's written in the chat that uh, what would I plug in to see this again on YouTube? I sadly, they're on the West Coast, which is awesome. And they couldn't get off work in time to see the whole thing. Um, we will, if you were here or registered for it, because many people are registered from our, our webinars, but they can't quite come to the, the live uh, presentation. So they wait for the recording. We will be sending out links of how you'll be able to link to the podcast as well as link to the YouTube version. So don't worry, folks, you'll be able to watch it again and we'll make sure you get uh, that link and connection. Anyone else, any questions or comments? Mm -hmm. She's happy about that, that's great. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for participating, folks. Next week, I'm sorry, next month, I should say, in October, the third Thursday is usually when we uh, present our webinars. We'll be on posture and how yoga, particularly we'll be focusing on the yoga aspect of our Discover Health Movement membership and posture. So don't miss that as well. So let's, we'll see everybody on the next presentation. Thank you. Bye-bye, everybody.